Welcome everyone to a new edition of CBSI Presents Indie Spotlight Series. We have a fantastic show for you tonight. We have the founders of Bolt Comics with us, Damien and Adrian Wassel. Go and introduce yourself, guys. Hey, I'm Damien Wassel, CEO and publisher at Bolt, and I am Adrian Wassel, the editor-in-chief here at Bolt. Thanks for having us on. Yeah, thanks so much. We're really excited about this. And we are super excited for you guys to be here with us tonight. Joining me tonight, we also have the co-host, Jack DeMeo, a.k.a. Mr. Bolo. What's going on, buddy? Oh, what's going on, Brian? Excited to be here for another Indie Spotlight Series show. And, uh, of course, extra excited to be uh, working with one of our CBSI partners, uh, Vault, here to do a little interview and uh, discuss all things Vault Comics. But, you know, I got to bring in the third member of our team, of course, the person, the namesake of the show, the Indie Spotlight Series show, Andy Tomberlin, the writer of the Indie Spotlight series on comicbookinvest.com. Andy, what's going on, bud? Hey, everybody. How's it going? CBSI Nation. Uh, Andy here with the Indie Spotlight series, and I couldn't be happier to have these two guys uh, here tonight from Vault and uh, ready to get this thing kicked off and, and see what all we can get to. Damien and Adrian, for those unfamiliar with who you are and who Vault is, can you give us a little bit of history on yourselves and how Vault came to be? Yeah, so Vault is a family-owned publisher of science fiction and fantasy comics based in Missoula, Montana. Uh, Vault's existed since July 2016, and uh, we've been putting out some of your favorite science fiction and fantasy comics ever since. Uh, gems like Heathen, The Savage Shores, Fearscape, Friendo, Wasted Space, the list goes on. Um, had some really exciting multimedia news recently. Uh, and, you know, as for sort of how we came to found Vault, I think Adrian does a better job telling that story than I do. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I think it started, um, as these stories typically do, with a, a long box of <laughs> old back issues. Um, Damien and I have been voracious uh, consumers of comic books and all geekdom and nerddom forever and ever. And uh, one day... I guess about a decade ago, we decided we would give give it a shot making our own comics. And um, our cousin, Nathan, who's done a ton of those uh, killer vault vintage covers, including that uh, Savage Chores that I see right there. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, yeah, that Tomb of Dracula, that, that incredible cover. Um, so that's our cousin, Nathan. And uh, we decided that the three of us were going to try making some books and we made a couple of comics ourselves and self-published took them to conventions did the hustle and slowly built the infrastructure to um to really publish a book we negotiated a like a, a deal with diamond to distribute and before long we realized like oh you know we have all the tools to publish um and there are all these creators with incredible stories that they want to tell and so we started laying the groundwork for Vault in about in 2016 and then launched our first two books, Heathen and Fissure, in February of 2017. And uh, yeah, the rest has been just trying to keep up with the moving train. Wow. Yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty interesting. That's uh, that kind of, I guess it, it, it leads me to my next question, creative mind energy. Um, and, and the Atoll, I was a big fan of that book, a huge fan of that book. We got issue two and it kind of went away, but it seemed like when it went away, Vault was born. Um, and I was okay with that from, from what y'all, from what y'all did afterwards. It was, it was great. Um, I don't, I don't want you guys to think that was like a thing left on some sacrificial altar. Uh, it was, it was more or less that, you know, we shifted, Tim, Adrian and I shifted our objectives to getting, getting Vault to where we wanted it to be. And, uh, you know, Atoll is one of, uh, increasingly small, decreasingly large. I don't know what I want to say here. A smaller and smaller handful of lingering projects that we have every intention of wrapping up, uh, when the time is right. So, wow. Yeah. And CME was, uh, you know, that was the title under which we were self-publishing and pushing stuff and doing those cons. And it was when Damien and I were uh, still much greener and much newer to all of this. And Tim was working on Atoll 
I actually met Tim at a signing where he was signing um, Enormous and I was signing my book Gifted at Hastings together and struck up the friendship. And um, it's uh, obviously been an incredible friendship and creative partnership and business partnership working with Tim. So I know he, uh, we, we, like Damien said, we have plans to hopefully wrap that up and, and finish that too. Um, it was just a matter of shifting and building vault and realizing that we were going to make vault work. We had to pour everything into it. Oh, well, I, that's totally understandable. And I, I think that's huge news to know that it's still out there and, and, and can still come about, come to fruition. So that's, uh, that's huge. And, and you hit on Tim Daniel there, the, the writer. I mean, that, that's huge, having a guy like that in your stable. Um, I mean, that's, uh, talk, talk a little bit about him and what he brings to the table. Tim brings, uh, Tim brings everything to the table. He's, um, <laughs> he's a mad genius, that man. There's nothing he can't do. Um, in fact, actually, I'll show you this cool thing. One second. Yeah, he, yeah. he, uh, he literally just inked this uh, as a, for a cover for one of our uh, wow. upcoming books. He, he can literally do everything. Wow. Um, and we can send you, uh, we, can, we can show you that. We can send that to you guys. To, to that title's not announced yet, though, so yeah. we'll play it close to the best. Yeah, yeah. but we can show you the promo yeah. image. Um, so he does everything. He brings everything to the table. And that was the thing that uh, I think kind of built our friendship was that Tim knew how much I cared about comics and I, it was immediate how much he cared about comics. And he just has such a rich knowledge of the history of comics that we would spend hours talking about it. And Damien and I were already laying the groundwork for Vault. And so I approached him and asked him, hey, uh, just friendly, like conversation would you take a look at some of the design elements and some of the books that i'm you know i've been working on with creators editorially and tim turned around and said i want to i want to build this with you guys i want to publish my next books with you i want to help steer the the branding i want to be a partner with you guys from day one and vault wouldn't be what it is today without tim and i having had that conversation tim seeing my our enthusiasm and you know matching it every day if not exceeding it so yeah tim brings everything to the table from design to writing uh you know to just overall like damien's making sure that everybody's all hands are on deck and the, sh the ship is sailing tim's helping me think up new places to sail every day he's always got something on the horizon something cooking yeah, he seems like he fits in well too. I'm a, I follow him on Instagram, and uh, he, he's a big family guy too. And I mean, it's it's like y'all are all based on family, man. That's uh that's pretty cool. That's definitely a a winning uh, recipe there. It seems like <laughs> it is. We it try. Is. Yeah, and Tim is basically family. I mean, we hung out and watched uh, Game of Thrones every Sunday for years <laughs> at his place. Like uh, I think of him as family. Yeah, I mean, Nate's a co-founder of the business. He's been with us from, from day one. And, uh, you know, these days he works as an art director and staff illustrator and, you know, general business partner. So, you know, he has a hand in all of the sort of operational and strategic thinking that we do. But then he's also, you know, doing some of our highest value art on some of our, you know, most priority projects. So, for example this uh you know vintage cover series that he and tim you know tim's idea but he and tim have been executing together um and then he's also currently you know illustrating uh dark one which is a project we have with you know multiple new york times best-selling author brandon sanderson that's coming together for 2020 and nate's work for that is uh, absolutely mind-blowingly amazing so you know yeah Nate, Nate's just a tremendously valuable member of the team in addition to being uh, our cousin and like my oldest friend. <laughs> so, Well, you, you, you brought up a, a good point there. Um, you talking about Nate and talking about uh, Tim Daniel and their um, contribution. The Vault Vintage line has been kind of crucial for you guys as far as like secondary market success and introducing you guys to a lot of say speculators from our community investors and collectors um have you guys seen that on your end what has that been like for you guys and uh 
how did that idea come to be and where do you hope that program goes in the future it's been it's been enormously beneficial um and i would say not just because you know collectors and speculators are great for finding and highlighting indie titles and pushing them and championing them but because specifically with our books like these savage shores every time i see somebody raving about the covers they're buying multiple copies and they're reading them and they're real like they're engaged fans and i mean how can you ask for anything other than a fan that wants to make sure you know he or she grabs every cover like that's that's killer and um yeah that the whole vault vintage cover line is i think sort of part and parcel of our overall strategy which is we know we're a newer brand we know we're bringing new icons and new stories to light and it's super important that we be able to tell people pretty simply like hey if you like this thing then you'll probably like our story and the vault vintage is a really simple really effective really fun way that's creatively fulfilling for us to do that if you you know if you love classics like you know the tomb of dracula if you love classics like madame like madame xanadu or anything like that then yeah grab the covers uh that are homaging those and then pick them up and read our books and you'll probably end up loving those stories too because what we're paying like homage to and what we're honoring is in the dna of the stories we're telling it's it's the it's part of the inspiration um and we cooked up that scheme kind of it was sort of a fun thing where we reached out to um derek robertson to do a cover for wasted space that was a spoof um of crisis uh and he killed it. He knocked the cover out of the park. And then Tim just had like this aha moment. I was like, let's just do this. Let's do this for all of our books. Like, why would we not? It's so much fun. We get to honor the, all the creators that helped lay the groundwork for where we are today. And it's like a perfect calling card. It tells people like, Oh, if you love this title, then try our title. And, uh, and it was a great aha moment. <laughs> it's a good epiphany on Tim's part. Yeah. And, uh, it's you know been a very successful initiative for us both with speculators and with general readers i've had so many retailers tell me i managed to sell friendo to people who only have marvel comics on their pull list because you guys did that frank miller daredevil cover and my marvel reader came in picked that up because they needed to have that cover then read it because it's such a darn good book it came back and subscribed to the whole series. So it, what it's done is helped us, you know, market indie books to people who might not traditionally be indie readers, in addition to the traction we've gotten with speculators and, and investors. Um, so it's been a really successful initiative. And it's one we're really proud of because ultimately, like, these, these covers that we're honoring are the reasons we all love these books in the first place. Yeah, and, you know, I was talking about Tim and I having those conversations, like those deep dives into comic book history, just how rich his knowledge is. And it's it's been really fun for us to uh, write up those blurbs on the back, the vault vintage blurbs on the back of the covers that give people a chance to, um, maybe they know everything about it and that's why they're picking the cover up, or maybe they only know a little bit. And, like, I've learned a lot from Tim and working with Tim. and. Um, you know, it's cool to like do a Grey Morrow cover and uh, and then like put on the back a little bit of the history of that. And maybe somebody will pick that book up and, and then learn something about this, this industry and the incredible like titanic creators that have come before us and paved the way. The most fun part of the process, I think, are the brainstorming sessions we have and we're trying to figure out which, <laughs> which cover to homage for which title. And one of the best parts of that is that we always discover the, you know, these really ludicrous moments in the history of comic book covers. Like I just conjured up a, a adventure comics cover 
uh, the other day with Supergirl with Medusa snake hair turning the <laughs> Justice League to stone while some old geezers in business suits are running away. It's like, yeah, like, and, and the, she's got like a bowl that says, "I can't help myself," and they're like, "Super, uh, they're, they're like Supergirl, you're your turning Medusa every- head is turning everyone to stone." stone. And there's these great covers like that that we stumble across that are so much fun. Well, and it's it's funny you guys mentioned bo- both of the things you guys just mentioned there because we have actually partnered with you guys and produced uh, Queen of Bad Dreams number one uh, vault retailer vintage uh, variant. And the one thing when we first got the uh, imaging back from it, the thing that we were blown away by was as much as the cover was beautiful was the back. We were stunned by the presentation of the back. Um, The way we were presented along with the history of the book, as well as the initiative that you guys were trying to do. And we thought, what a great way to tell um, the story. So I I think wholeheartedly you guys are hitting a home run with that level of detail. And I can relate to you guys talking about the brainstorming sessions, because obviously we've been having those similar discussions about trying to produce future variants with you guys. And it uh, it is very funny because myself, Brian, um, the owner of CBSI, Ben C. We don't always um, have the same tastes and see the same <laughs> vision. So having those kinds of discussions of golden age versus silver age versus modern versus what what the look of the book should be, it, it, it's been interesting. So I can relate to that on a small scale, what you guys must be doing on a very large scale. Yeah, but it's, those are the, like, those disagreements are the best because ultimately what you're doing is sort of rehashing your love for comic books. And even if you might have some slightly different aesthetic like choices than somebody else on the team, you're having this like loving conversation about about the thing that connects all of us. Um, and so I hope that like the covers inspire other people to do that too, right? Even if they don't, even if they're not engaged in like getting to actually do an exclusive cover with us, they're just a, a reader who's picking it up. Like I hope that they can like argue with their friend and be like, no, this cover is great for these reasons and, and have those fun conversations. And sometimes when you're digging through all those old covers, you like you come across these pieces that are like, unbelievably tawdry or ludicrous but nonetheless still just like stunning artwork like i stumbled across this sensational tales cover the other day that was like absolutely tawdry but also just like dumbfoundingly gorgeous and it's really fun to find these pieces where you know like an artist is giving their all on a strange concept and just <laughs> knocking it out of the park that that was going to bring my question is when you're doing those covers, is it purely from a passion and from the you guys and the and the creators, or do you take into the, or do you take into account, hey, this is a great cover, but will it sell our books, or is there kind of a a marriage between the two of, hey, we really like doing this, we want to do this homage, and it's a passion of ours, but we also want to take into account their reader and what they will like and what we think will actually kind of move the books off the shelf. Yeah, there's so many factors that go into the decision. And then there, I think, just some like implicit unvoiced components. Um, We try to find covers that are historically important, whether that means they're really valuable or something special happened in that, you know, particular issue, a first appearance or a first, you know, standalone. Um, and then we try to make sure that those are thematically related to the title that we're doing the, the vintage cover for. And then, of course, we try to make sure that there is a way to execute that cover as a cover for the series we have in mind. Because sometimes we'll hit, we'll hit on a cover that's thematically related and, you know, really historically important. There's just no way to make it fit the content of the book. Um, and then, or for Tim to like figure out how to re sort of like reverse engineer the, the title design dress, yeah, yeah, and the title dress and all of that. Yeah, and then we so then we have to crack the design, and then the final part of it is like, is it a cover? You know, because Tim and Nathan do all of these together. Like, is it a cover that sparks something of an, an inspiration in the two of them? Because they're you know, like we're we were working on one the other day and I was just throwing cover after cover after cover at, at, at Tim. And you know, none of them were catching for him. So we have to get 
like tick all of those first boxes and then get that ineffable moment of inspiration for for Tim and Nathan. So it's it's a a complicated process, but when it works, you know, we have these really awesome moments like uh just the other day after the uh Elf Quest cover went up that we did. So we did an Elf Quest uh homage for the cover. Map. Yeah. Uh you know, I got an email from from Richard Peeney the day after those went live saying, hey, this is really awesome. Thanks for doing that. I want to make sure I get a few copies when it goes up. And, um, you know, for everybody who might not know, he's the co-creator of ElfQuest with his wife, Wendy. So, you know, that was, this really fun. And those little moments make it, you know, even, uh, even more rewarding than the bigger success already did. <laughs> Right. I mean, that's kind of what it's about, too. I mean, you're you're paying homage to them and for, for them to take notice of it. That's uh, that that pretty much says, hey, you, you've done a hell of a job on it, you know? Yeah, that uh, Derek Robertson and Warren Ellis both got really excited when they saw the um, Transmetropolitan uh, homage cover that we did for test. Um, Derek got on Twitter and was like <laughs> tweeting about it. He's like, this is so cool to see it come full circle like I did the first one for these guys uh you know with the George Perez crisis cover and now they're paying homage to you know Transmetropolitan and it was really that was like a really fun moment so yeah that's that's like that's what it's all about is trying to capture those moments Oh yeah, hundred percent. I know I have my personal favorite out of the whole line, and we might as well get to it. It's the elephant in the room, uh, the Savage Shores, the the Tomb of Dracula one. I mean, that one is, I mean, it's 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 unreal, you know. Um, <laughs> just like the story, I mean, that kind of segues into that. I mean, that it, I call it big boy reading. I got it from uh, one of our guys at CBSI, Clint Jocelyn, who loves that book too. And I mean, it's just it's there. Everything about it is there. T tell us a little bit about these Savage Shores and, and kind of where it came from, how it all was born. Yeah, so um, Ram V, who uh, writes these Savage Shores, uh, has lived everywhere. He's lived in India. He's lived in the United States. He's lived in London. Um, he's, I think he's currently uh, living in London now. And so he has a very unique uh, perspective on storytelling and he has just this wealth of uh, sort of cultural mythologies that he understands really, really well. And the voice that he brings is incredibly authentic. And he approached um, Vault with this, uh, this pitch for these savage shores and it was a no-brainer as soon as he sent it along i said i was like rom you've, you've made incredible books in the past um you know we've been having ongoing conversations about uh basically finding the right project and this is it this is the perfect project and everybody who reads this is going to recognize that immediately uh, because you could just feel his passion. And we were looking for artists. Um, Ram was really committed to uh, making sure that his co-creators and collaborators on the book were also uh, Indian creators because there are a lot of, as you know, as readers, like really culturally relevant moments uh, historically, um, even just even small things like the dance that Corey does in the first issue is uh, a dance that has in many ways been lost to history. So kind of doing that and honoring that um, required somebody who really understood, uh, you know, the like the moment they're trying to capture there. And so, yeah, this book just came together where like everybody understood it top to bottom, a ditch on the letters, like, doing all those hand letters that he's done throughout is incredible. And the fact that he's willing to pour that amount of time and love into it just shows that the whole team is working um, in concert and they all understand. And then on top of that, it's just a really, really fun story about, you know, like ancient sort of demon gods battling it out, um, ultimately in the name of love and humanity. And uh, so, Long story short, Rom brought that pitch to me, and I said, "Like Rom, this is going to be one of the best comic books anybody ever publishes, and uh, I'm here to just support you every step of the way of making that happen." And when issue one sold out, 
um, that Tomb of Dracula cover was just, it was perfect. And it was something we'd already talked about. Dracula was a big part of the sort of DNA of, um, of these Savage Shores. Some of the stuff that he was incorporating and some of the stuff he was sort of rewriting, right? Like he's recontextualizing vampire stories. And so uh, that just came up and Nathan immediately said to Tim, like, I, I can do this cover I see it perfectly and they knocked it out of the park and that, I mean, yeah, that cover is not just your favorite, but many, many, many people's favorite for a reason. I think it's that confluence of all those things. Incredible story, beautiful, like beautiful art by, uh, by Sumit and Vittorio and then like stunning letters, everything coming together, the obvious candidate for the cover. And then Nathan and Tim just like that, that book is a personal favorite of theirs too. So they were champing at the bit to be able to knock that cover out and they did. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, it's, it's knocked everything out, the, the story and the, and the, and the cover. Yeah. Right. And, I remember when that showed up in, I, I can't remember if it was, I think it was previews when they showed up the second print and they, the cover for that. I didn't even know at the time what the comic book was. I just saw the art. And I'd already had a copy of the first print, but I was like, what is that? And the second print, I immediately called up Third Eye Comics and said, hey, I want to order five copies of this. And it wasn't even for a speculator point of view. It's, I love that cover, that cover art so much, and I love that story. So I ordered five covers and gave four of those to friends just because I wanted them to see how gorgeous that cover, that great homage was, and then how great that story was just to get that word of mouth spread. Because I hate when I like a book so much and you're talking to people about it and they don't know anything about it and you can't have that conversation back and forth with them. So I got multiple copies and gave them to them. And then we started now, whenever a new issue of these seven shores drops and we're all getting it and they're already talking about it. So kudos to that on just great story, great writer, great art. I love the whole book. Well, and thank you. I mean, honestly, like that's, that's incredible. That story was just put the biggest smile on my face and that'll stay for, for, you know, days or weeks uh, or months even, because that's, that's what it's all about. If you can ever, if you can capture one fan who just really sees it and loves it and is willing to buy multiple copies to give to friends like that, there's nothing more satisfying or fulfilling as an editor than knowing that the creators you're working with are doing their best work and capturing those fans that just like appreciate it so much that they can't even keep contain it they have to share it with other people that's that's the best thing about storytelling is connecting people i have to say that um savage shores cover is the only time i think we were all in perfect unison about what cover we should <laughs> we should homage it was the only time there was never any any dissent you know we were like we need to do one what's it going to be and we were all like almost in perfect you know unison we're like oh tomb of dracula is the obvious choice <laughs> yeah that's that's awesome for sure yeah i know when we were first we did queen of bad dreams but when we were first talking about it that's why i asked that question earlier about what's the passion the story and how you guys choose them me i was so passionate about that story we were like hey jack and i were talking we wanted to do like a morbius an asm kind of morbius homage and then ultimately we're like we went with Queen of Bad Dreams with the Detective 31 cover, which is still a great cover, but we did have that conversation and Tomb of Dracula is definitely a winner. That's <laughs> yeah, definitely made it a big winner for us. Uh, we had we had a few of them remaining at Emerald City Comic Con this year, and I won't say what we sold them for, but <laughs> they, they, they were a nice revenue bump at the show. <laughs> Oh yeah, they 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 went crazy. I mean, it, yeah, there's very few of them out there. I mean, it was like somewhere around a thousand, something like that. Uh, exactly this number I heard. So, yeah, so, exactly one thousand, and they're still, you know, a few of them sitting here in this office that are never going out there. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, a thousand mind. out there in the world. <laughs> yeah, hey, I got I've got one in a box over there uh, that's <laughs> never going anywhere. So yeah, it's uh, it's it's great, man. And and to go back to the story a little bit. I, one of the outlets I use is uh, like Comic Book Roundup. They, they give the reviews of the cumulative reviews of all the people that have read the book and submit to it. The Savage Shores has a 9.9 .9 and is the highest that I have seen on there staying at the top. I mean, 
at one time, it was these Savage Shores, Friendo, and uh, there was one other uh, title up there, a vault title, too. Oh, there were two others. Wasted yeah, Scape yeah. And, Fearscape and Wasted Space. Yeah, Fearscape, yeah. exactly. So, I mean, that speaks to what you guys are doing over there. It's not just about these awesome covers. It's about quality, you know? I mean, and that, that, that says something. That's something to build on and to – be building into that sci-fi type genre. I mean, you, you've got it going on with that for sure. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's the work every single day. Uh, they get excited coming in and keeps us busy once we're in is making sure that quality is there for every every single story. And you know, we'll, we will always, relative to some other publishers out there, have a smaller, more focused catalog because. You know, I edit every bubble and every panel of every page of every comic, and Tim pours his life and love into every single, you know, design and title and IFC and IBC, even putting little fun, like, parentheticals in the uh, Indicia, where it's, like, all, you know, uh, like, people or whatever that are based on a tolls a a tolls a great example since you're a fan of that if you flip that open you go to the in uh it'll it'll say you know all all resemblances to to persons real or imagined including people devoured by sharks yeah and and basically every single in that we print yeah and that's just that's that's it it's the you know it's all in the details it's all in the love and the passion uh making sure those stories are great very cool. Very cool. All right. So obviously with my role with comicbookinvest.com as a content manager, managing social media, one of the biggest things that kind of moves our community is option announcements. And you guys had a big one in the last couple of weeks with the announcement of Sci-Fi picking up a 10 episode option for Vagrant Queen. Can you tell us a little bit about how that came to be and what you guys are really hoping for from that series? Yeah, so just to be clear, that's a it's a full ten episode season order. They're gonna they're filming in three four weeks, so the you know it's completely cast and uh, it'll be on the air in twenty twenty. Um, you know the from from a sort of business and strategic perspective, right? Like we're we're most interested in seeing this thing be on the air for a bunch of seasons, but from you know, story, the perspective of storytellers, we're really keen to see this be a great show. And the thing is, from the moment we saw the first scripts, uh, I guess around November of last year, um, we, we knew they had, you know, Blue Ice, the production company that's involved, had just absolutely the perfect vision for this. Jem Gerard, the showrunner that they've hired, uh, cracked this in a way that few adaptations managed to get a hold of their source material. And every creative decision that's been made along the way seems to have been the best one that could have been made. So I'm very excited about uh, this show. And it's been so much fun engaging with the, the people uh, that they've, they've cast. So Adrian Ray, Tim Brazone, uh, Paul Detroit, and, uh, you know, uh, Alex, I can't remember her like Gregory, I think. Uh, the most recent cast member we've announced. They've been just like awesome people. And I think, you know, we're hoping to grow the fan community for Vagrant Queen, grow the fan community for Vault, and, you know, really see to it that a great show gets made. Well, have you, I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, Vagrant Queen number one has shot up considerably in price and has yeah. landed on the CBSI Hot 10 list as well uh, since the announcement. So I think that it's definitely working getting the exposure out there. It'll be interesting to see once the show hits. But Sci-Fi has had some success recently with option announcements with Happy and Deadly Class. Um, do you, how do you think it'll fit in with their current roster of shows? Well, I think, you know, with the casting overlap that it has with Winona Earp, uh, specifically with Tim Razone, you know, famous for his awesome mustache and, <laughs> and you know, lovable temperament. Um, I think we're going to see a lot of carryover from one fandom to the other. Uh, and I, I also, you know, I think that 
it's going to hit some notes that we really haven't gotten to see on TV in a long time. I think it's really going to play well to fans of Firefly, yep. um, fans of Red Dwarf, fans of these sort of humorous uh, sci-fi romps. It's ultimately, you know, it's it's a story about messing about in space and like sort of ludicrous and lowbrow ways. And there's a lot of other stuff going on, but that's sort of the core of what make, makes each little episode of the story work. And Jem, who is show running it, you know, really got that from, from the get go. And I think, as I said, we're going to see a lot of other fandoms that have, uh, you know, looked to sci-fi or looked to other, you know, components of the broader NBC universal uh, banner for for their sci-fi content, you know, come into this show. Yeah, I read the um, first four uh, episode scripts, um, and when I when I finished them, I I, be, I I guess like the best thing I can say is that I enjoyed them in the same way I enjoyed Guardians of the Galaxy. Like I got through those first four scripts, and I like laughed in the same ways and had, but also had the same like connection emotionally. Uh, and it was a really kind of surreal, fun experience to do that, uh, having, you know, edited the comic and then getting to see these episodes way before, you know, anyone else. And this being the first time we've, we've gotten to do that with a TV series. Um, and it was just, it was really cool to read that and, you know, kind of forget by like page five that I was supposed to be doing a job and was just reading it as a fan and was <laughs> like, man, I like this show so much. Oh, wait, that's right. It's based on one of our comics. That's cool. <laughs> and at its core, you know, this is a, a piece of fiction that is, you know, really inclusive. So two of the creators in the original book, trans, uh, you know, the entire writing and directing team for the show are women. Uh, the protagonist is, you know, a woman of color. And the show deals a whole lot with like what it means to interact with authority figures <laughs> and governmental authority, et cetera, et cetera. So I, like, I really think as sci-fi goes, it's going to play some notes a lot of sci-fi shows haven't in the past to, you know, to its uh, benefit. Yeah, so. it's going to marry the, the sort of philosophical questions and social questions that it's um you know discussing with this like like i said this just intensely warm sort of humor and and heart and I, I that's the best thing like wasted space is another one of our books another space opera uh that i think does a you know uh in a very different way it it it, it does that same thing which is it it gets you to um, broach really interesting difficult nuanced subjects and rather than just sort of telling you how everything is, it makes it encourages you to think about that amid these ridiculously zany, hilarious, crazy scenarios where you have like, you know, robots and people in space fighting. <laughs> it's like, it's so much fun. And I, I love that our books do that. And I love that we're now going to reach an even broader audience by way of uh, sci-fi and blue ice, um, you know, bringing that, uh, bringing Vagrant Queen to life for television. Well, and, and it's interesting that you mentioned Wasted Space, um, you know, as big as the Vagrant Queen announcement is, and it's huge. Uh, it wasn't the only announcement that you guys had in the last several weeks. You guys also announced that you came to an agreement with Michael Marisi to come back and do more Wasted Space, as well as do an audio adaptation. Can you tell us a little bit about that? What you hoped for the audio adaptation? And, uh, you know, it seems a little different, something, something new in the market. Yeah, so we, um, we came back, uh, you know, so Wasted Space was originally going to be 10 um, with this hope that it might one day be longer. And rather than go to 15, we went to 20 because we had such a solid audience for it. And it's so good. And there were creative reasons. And then we bumped up again to 25 um, because Mike and Hayden, the artist Hayden Sherman, um, just had a vision for how, uh, how far they wanted to carry it. And they knew that they needed those five extra issues. And we knew that the fans would support it. Um, and so 
that was part of that like big Mike Maurice announcement that we had. And uh, the audio book is a really cool thing um, because in a, the best way I can explain it is like, now, I don't think every comic can live as an audio production. It has to be the right comic because when you think about comics, you think like immediately of the art. And if it's audio, how do you capture that? The thing that's great about Wasted Space is that Hayden has created such a rich, fun world that the people that are doing the audio production, graphic audio, have all this stuff to play with. They have the noise of the blasters, they have the spaceships, they have all these incredible settings that Hayden has brought to life in art that they now get to bring to life in audio. And so like as much as I wanna give all the credit uh, to Mike, because he's amazing. And, uh, you know, his book, Black Star Renegades, almost won aud audio book of the year. So he knows what he's doing um, in the audio space with that. I also have to give tons of credit to Hayden, because not every comic could make that transition um, from the art to audio and give somebody like graphic audio enough to work with to recreate those scenes um, for you to sort of hear and imagine. And um, one yeah. thing, one thing that I thought was really cool, and I was thinking about this the other night, is how uh, we're going to be able to reach with comic books, you know, an entire uh, readership that typically doesn't get to read comics. So if you are or hard, you know, you have any kind of visual impairment or are blind, uh, it's going to be really cool to be able to enjoy wasted space. And that was something that was just like really fulfilling and really cool um, to know that like. Not only are we reaching a new audience through audio, we're also making comic books uh, accessible to people that may not always have them, um, which is really cool. And Graphic Audio has been an absolutely awesome partner to get to work with. Um, we were introduced to them through a, you know, a Jabberwocky, the agency that represents our audio rights, and they've just they've been great. And Wasted Space is going to be the first of of several. Uh, audio adaptations we put into production with them and then it's you know that's part of a, a larger audio strategy that we have uh, you know Adrian and I have been audiobook fanatics for a decade now uh, and we've always wanted to find a way into that space and it just you know sort of took us a little while to get the catalog to where we needed to be uh, to make those relationships happen from a business perspective, but we're super excited to get Wasted Space out there. Uh, not not only because, you know, Hayden and Mike have created this world that lends itself to audio so perfectly, but because uh, Rick, the guy at Graphic Audio, who's taking the lead on this project, he just loves this book. Like, he's got such a deep and abiding interest in the fiction that Mike and Hayden have created and such a vision for how to execute it in audio. And probably a lot of your listeners have never uh, never seen graphic audio stuff. Um, they're full cast, like full sound effects uh, productions. You know, their slogan is, it's like a movie in your mind. And it really and is. They're re they really are, and they're really, really fun. And that's that's where I'll circle back around to, to Mike and sing his praises some. Uh, he, uh, Mike knows how much I, I love him. He is an author that has really found his voice. And uh, that voice is the component that's going to make the audio. Um, you know, I talked about how Hayden has brought a world to life and marry that with the voice that, uh, that Mike creates for these characters. And you've just got the perfect cocktail because Molly, Dust, uh, Billy, Fury, they all sound different they all have different points of view and they all feel authentic as characters. Like you can imagine their lives off the page. And that's, that's exactly what graphic audio needs to, to really bring a production to life. And that, that announcement was part of an even bigger strategy with Mike, um, not to, you know, sing his praises too much, uh, but, but Mike is an incredible author and an incredible creator, um, an incredible, collaborator i love working with them everybody who works with them loves working with them and um we just announced uh his uh book mall um co-written with gary doberman who's the screenwriter of the new it films and um 
show running Swamp Thing and uh, just an incredibly cool dude. And he and Mike have established a great friendship and are co-writing this really fun book, Mall. And we've got more stuff even cooking up with Mike. So there's a lot coming uh, on that side. And and I, I just count myself lucky to have been able to create the sort of professional relationship that I have with Mike and the friendship because I think he's doing some of the best storytelling in comics there is and clearly his stories can exist beyond just the comic book page whether that's audio or maybe someday seeing his stuff on screen too oh I'm working on it no I know (laughs) dropping hints (laughs) yeah one thing I like about him also is he's another one that's very approachable on social media he responds to people um like I behind me when I recently picked up the trade paperback for the first volume i had read the floppies but I don't like reading floppies I like putting those in my collection so I always pick up the trade paperback and as soon as you posted if you tagged him on social media he's responding back oh and asking you questions how do you like it and I always say about wasted space if Star Wars and Guardians of the Galaxy had a baby you would have wasted spaces <laughs> as, as a product for it so definitely enjoy that I was like really happy when it got um, extended from from the previous series that it was going to run. But yeah, yeah, we're we're thrilled. It's going to be really cool. It's it's breaking ground for us to go to twenty five issues. I mean, we've been publishing books for a little over two years, so to get to go to twenty five with one series is it's really exciting. Um, and I cannot wait for the day that we have five trades. And those five trades are a big, giant, hardcover compendium. 25 issues is nearly 600 pages of content. Yeah, it's awesome. It's really cool that we're going to hit that mark. The next thing I want to talk about is some of the upcoming titles y'all have on the horizon. Uh, some of these books that are that are getting ready to come out that uh, you might can let the people know about and, and kind of what to look out for. Yeah, I think there are three things we should we should mention. So... Uh, Coming out later this month is a new series from Chris Sabella called Test that's sort of a biopunk Western about this non-binary person who travels into the desert to find this mythical town, Laurelwood, that'll sell you technology from the future. And it's the sort of like engaging, haunting, fucked up science fiction that (laughs) Like we've all loved since the first time we cracked a William Gibson book open. Uh, and it's some of the most revolutionary science fiction, you know, I've seen in comics in, in a long time. And, you know, Chris's writing is brilliant and Jen's art is incredible. And, you know, we've got amazing colors from Harry Saxon and some of the best letters I've ever seen uh, from, from Hassan. Atzman Elhau, and it's just going to be a great book. And then we're extra pumped about our two uh, July releases we have coming up, uh, Sarah and the Royal Stars and Resonant, both of which, you know, uh, orders close on uh, in June 24th. And maybe Adrian can tell you about those. Oh, yeah, I'd love to. Um, yeah, Sarah and the Royal Stars uh, is honestly just one of the most beautiful books uh i've ever had the the pleasure of working (laughs) on um it's so much fun to edit john sway and audrey mock are co-creating um raul angulo is doing colors and letters by jim campbell of wasted space um it's this really like incredible sort of mashup of uh like just heartwarming like humorous moments and like heartbreaking uh sort of family moments and it's this big epic quest uh sarah the princess of parsa has to restore um these fallen stars to the heavens so the seasons can turn again and it will end like this famine that's been sort of plaguing her her kingdom and empire and it's this expansive quest but it manages to always stay super grounded on these really really fun um really great characters that you can't help but fall in love with uh because the pacing is perfect and it's re- it's like laugh out loud funny yeah there are moments times. that will just kill you like you'll crack up so much and then the next page 
you'll turn and you like, you know, you like clutch your chest and like almost cry. Um, and I love that so much. I love whenever somebody can pull that off. I feel like anybody who loved Heathen or like Monstrous or Isola or Avatar The Last Airbender, those kind of quest stories that do that, that capture like humor and heart, but also have like really felt stakes that are big and, and impactful, um, are they're gonna love Sarah and the Royal Stars. Um, so I cannot recommend that book highly enough. Um, and then behind, you know, right next to that, we have Resonant. Um, Resonant is a story that I have been in love with since the first day that David Andrew pitched it to me. And David Andrew is one of these genuinely unsung heroes of comics. He has volunteered uh, at the Skybound booth for since day one of Skybound. And he has hand sold so many thousands of comic books to fans just purely as a volunteer. Um, and he has introduced hundreds of creators to editors that have sparked huge careers and he's good friends with people that have enjoyed those massive sort of breaks in their careers and those big big pushes um and it's all because he's just genuinely one of the best people uh i've ever met and he pitched resonant um to me a couple years ago and we worked on it and we got it in line and we figured out when we wanted to launch it. We found the perfect co-creator, which was the biggest thing. And uh, Alejandro Aragon is the artist. Um, and that pairing of Alejandro on inks and uh, Jason Wordy on colors is unreal. The book looks so good. And it's this crazy cool sort of psychological thriller meets um, like post-apocalyptic odyssey and it's about a father who has a chronically ill youngest son a daughter and another son and um they he, he needs to set out and sort of venture from their secluded home that they've built in the woods uh to go get medicine for his youngest son who needs it and you can tell there's something wrong wrong with the world some catastrophic thing that's happened and what's revealed by the end of issue one is that uh these waves sort of sweep across humanity that unlock our deepest impulses. So the worst, most terrifying, awful thoughts that you have, that you're thinking, whatever thing's scaring you most at that moment or um, you're most anxious about, you act on. So the worst enemy becomes yourself uh, and whoever's closest to you when these waves hit. And so it's the story of this father trying desperately to get back to his children um, after he ventures out and these waves start hitting again and um yeah it, it'll mess you up it's it's uh, it's nerve-wracking it's a really intense emotional book but it is also just breathtakingly beautiful and um full of some really really cool action moments too so yeah both of those come out uh in july and they foc june 20 june 24th um, yeah, they both dropped July 17th, just in, just in time for San Diego Comic-Con. So, you know, we'll have them there at the table, but we wanted to make sure that everybody else in the country could have them then too. So, yeah. you know, nobody was left behind. Yeah. So definitely check those out. Those are, those two books are things that we've been working on for a long time. And these creative teams have poured their heart and soul into those books. Uh, I know you won't be disappointed. Like I, I'm really excited to share uh some advanced looks at it with you guys um because i think you'll love them so major bolo there for you guys make sure you're contacting your lcs before um foc final order cutoff day so you can get that maximum discount and you can go ahead and get your orders in for multiple copies because you know with a lot of these independent releases when release day comes along if you're trying to secure multiple copies you may have a tough time at given LCSs across the country. So do your LCS a favor, do the publisher a favor, do the creators a favor, get in touch with them early, put your orders in. Um, this is your best opportunity. Um, and now, of course, guys, you guys are gonna do uh, vault vintage variants for these releases as well, right? correct? Correct. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we've actually got a couple surprises that are coming that yeah. we're really excited about. And you guys might know a little something about one of those surprises, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but um yeah we've got some vault vintage stuff coming and you know in previews everybody's seen uh too so for sarah and the royal stars we did you know uh maybe this is a cat that ate the canary moment but we we did an homage to heathen 
uh, he the number one and you know it's it's extraordinary and again you know you just get to see how incredibly versatile Nathan is and you also get to see how amazing an artist Natasha was in the first place for somebody to imitate her style and still create a piece that's that's so superb and uh, then Adrian can tell you about what we did for Resonant. Yeah for Resonant we did uh, Why the Last Man so classic cover uh who doesn't love bkb uh why the last man is one of my all-time favorite series and it was one of the series that most inspired um david to create resident in the first place this kind of epic global spanning quest after a sort of catastrophic moment focused in on you know this sort of single person trying to find their way through all of this. So like thematically, they're super similar. We did this killer homage cover of all vintage of, uh, for Resonant of Why the Last Man is stellar. I think you'll absolutely love it. Um, and then we've got a couple extra fun things cooking up uh, that that I, uh, I think I'll leave it to you guys to, um, you know, maybe spill the beans at some point. <laughs> Yes, yes. We've definitely got uh, some surprises coming along the way. Guys, stay tuned to Simple Men's Comics YouTube channel. You'll see it here first, as always. Family, remember, FOC, June 24th for these upcoming vault releases. Make sure you've locked your order in. Make sure you've got in touch with your LCS. If you don't have a local LCS, look online. Uh, be sure to check out Bat Comic Shop a great independent comic focused retailer and uh, get those orders in um, because you know, you never know what's going to be that next big series to pop. And also remember what these guys said, be on the lookout for future news coming from vault comics because it's San Diego comic con season. We never know what's going to happen. So be ready with those back issues as well, but get those orders in for FOC, make sure you got those orders locked down. So you're not scrambling on release day when we're talking about them on the CBSI Bolo show right here on Simple Men's Comics come new comic book day. So normally this time in the interview process, we have a little lightning round where I ask five questions off real quick and then you just answer the quickest to your ability. But tonight I'm gonna take a step back and I'm gonna spotlight one of my Patreon, my original Patreon members, original supporters of Simple Man's Comics, huge fan of Vault as well. He kind of helped introduce me to you guys. I've read some of your titles, but he, Definitely talked you guys up. So I want to give him the credit that he deserves. And I'm talking about Rajim Seabrook. He lives out there in Montana with you guys. And he was nice enough. He got copies of Alien Bounty Hunter signed from Adrian. And he sent me these copies out. And I couldn't thank him enough. So I know you guys are aware of him. But I wanted to give a huge thank you to Rajim. And since I had you guys on here, I wanted to see if you guys give him a shout out as well. Because I knew you guys talked to him. Yeah, of course. Hey, Regime. Hey, thank, Regime. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much uh, for uh, always championing our books. And uh, you got to come over soon. For, yeah, we got to get you out for another barbecue. Yeah, <laughs> come over and make some of your famous ribs again. <laughs> Regime, I know you're going to be watching this because you're all things vault. So can't thank you enough, especially for getting me onto more of their titles. And all you I needed was that little push, and I was off and running because huge vault fan. But Thank you. And thank you for your support on my channel. And thank you to all my other Patreon members as well. So we received a lot of great information from Adrian and Damien tonight. I can't thank them enough for taking time out of their schedule to answer some of our questions. So again, thank you guys. And before we go, is there anything else you would like to tell our audience? I just want to say thanks to everybody for, for tuning in and thanks to you guys for having us on. I mean, like we do it for folks like, you and for the people who will watch who watch your videos like nothing more important to us than sharing good stories with the world yeah it's uh it's just an absolute pleasure to find all the communities within comics that care so much and and want to want to talk and want to hear the answers and want to talk about the books and the stories uh, I can speak for all of our creators when I say we couldn't do it without all of you. And there's nothing that's, you know, nothing that feels better than finding these uh, true fans and true audiences and getting to engage with them. So thank you so much. And Jack, is there anything you wanted to say or anything else you wanted to ask Adrian and Damien? 
Absolutely. Well, first, I want to thank Adrian and Damien for, of course, joining us on the Simpleman's Comics YouTube channel. Um, we've enjoyed everything that we've done with our coverage of Vault, and it was great to get to sit down here and talk with them. Um, I'd also like to make sure that the audience is aware that the Indie Spotlight series is, comes out every Tuesday on comicbookinvest.com, highlighting this week's newest independent comic releases. Andy does a great job spotlighting some of the s small press publishers and everything independent comics for New Comic Book Day. Also, I want to make sure you be on the lookout on comicbookinvest.com. Click that variant tab and check out our Queen of Bad Dreams Vault Vintage variant uh, from da creator Danny Lore, cover by Nate Gooden. Incredible variant, uh, still few available. Be sure to check that out. Two dollars of every purchase goes to the St. Jude's Children's Hospital. And this is the Indie Spotlight Show, so it wouldn't be the Indie Spotlight Show without the Indie Spotlight writer, Andy Tomlin. Andy, <laughs> you got a snake in your boot? <laughs> <laughs> hey, guys, I just want to thank you all for coming on tonight with us. Uh, we, we've learned so much. We've learned uh, how Vault came to be. We've learned a, a, a bunch of good titles to look out for coming up. So make sure you heed the warning. Head to your uh, LCS. Get on the FOC so you're not stranded looking for these books uh, on release day. Uh, and, guys, like I say, I can't thank you enough. And thank you to everybody for watching. And I uh, hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you so much. And with that being said, make sure you click that thumbs up. And if you haven't already done so, please consider subscribing. Always new comic and pop culture content on Superman's Comics channel. Adrian, Damien. Thank you for joining us tonight. We look forward to having you on this channel once again. So thank you for watching us on another episode of CBSI Presents Indie Spotlight. And we'll see you guys on the next episode. Thanks so much.